Welcome, everyone. This is a class in UBI field experiments. And we're going to start out with the history of UBI leading up to the ex two rounds of experiments we've had. Um, now, so it's a class on UBI experiments or pilot projects or field experiments or trials. Um, and uh, there is not one unified word for for all of these things um whether one th there's no what what is the exact definition of a pilot project what is the exact definition of a trial over or, or of an experiment these don't have really good uh good well agreed definitions there are people who say that if it's not a random control trial it's not an experiment well that's not widely agreed by speakers of the english language uh, but the title includes the word field, field experiments. And that we're using, we're getting that specific meaning for why we call it a class in UBI field experiments. And that is that um, this is only about, this is not, well, that is to exclude laboratory experiments. This is a class in actually giving people living their real everyday lives a basic income for a while to see how it affects their behavior or their interactions with other people in the market. It's about that kind of experiment. It's not about getting a bunch of uh, undergraduate college students together in a room one afternoon and uh, giving them some incentives to do stuff for the for the day. Um, that's a laboratory experiment. This is field experiments that are giving people in their real life. Now, and the class is going to talk about what they are, how they work, where, when, and why they are happening, and importantly, what they don't show us. It's, it, it, it is, it's a class about what experiments can show us, but it's importantly about the limits, what the experiments do not show us. One of the central issues of my book, which we're using as the main textbook for this class, is that basic income experiments tell us a lot less than we want to. And which brings the question, well, what is their role in the debate and the discussion over whether we should adopt UBI when there are such limits to what they can tell us? So uh, we'll be looking at that throughout the semester. Now, um, I would guess that most people who are taking a master's course in UBI experiments are going to know what UBI is, but just in case, um, I will define it. Um, UBI usually stands, it most often stands for universal basic income. Often, though, it is also used to stand for unconditional basic income. And some people, the term, some people prefer the term with no U on it whatsoever, just BI or basic income. All three of those terms, universal basic income, unconditional basic income, and simply basic income, have the same meaning, which the basic income earth network defines as a grant with the five characteristics with five characteristics. It is periodic, it is in cash, it is individual, it is universal, and it is unconditional. Meaning, now periodic means that it's going to come regularly. So if you give people a whole bunch of money one time in their life, that's not a basic income. That's that's a one-time grant. If you give people, if you give it on a regular basis every week or maybe preferably every month, well, every year, or maybe preferably every month or maybe even better every week, or you could give it really every second, in very small increments, that's periodic. It's coming regularly. It's not a one-time grant. It's not a temporary grant. It is in cash. We are not giving you food vouchers. We are not giving you in-kind benefits. It's giving you cash. It is given to you as an individual with regardless to whether you are married, whether you're single, whether you have children, or you're not, or you don't have children, you get the same size grant. And if you are an adult, it goes to you. If you're a child, it's usually going to go to your mother, uh, but it might, in some cases, go to your father or a legal guardian. Uh, it is universal and unconditional. 
Now, technically, technically, those two terms mean the same thing. If it's universal, that means everybody gets it. And that means under all conditions, everyone gets it. Uh, so there are no conditions in which someone doesn't get it. That means if it's universal, it has to be unconditional in that sense. And if it's unconditional, if there are no conditions whatsoever to it, then, uh, then it must be universal. There are no conditions and everyone must get it. However, we use, uh, we use universal to emphasize that it is not means tested that we are giving it to people regardless of how much other income they have. Um, you could have something that was universal in the sense that it was a promise. I, we universally promise that everybody has, everybody with a low income is going get, to get it made up to this minimum amount. That would be a universal promise, but you wouldn't be giving it out universally. And that would also be unconditional in the sense when we say unconditional, we mean you do not have to work for it. And you do not have to prove that you can't work if you're not working. There's no requirement to work. There's no requirement to prove that you're looking for work. There's no requirement to prove that you would like to work but can't because you're ill or too old or too young. It is not conditional on you having to do something. So it could be unconditional in the sense we don't ask you to do something, but be conditional on whether or not you have low income. That would fail to be universal in this sense. It would have a universal promise, but it wouldn't be universally delivered to everyone. That policy that is very much like basic income, but it is, but it is means tested uh, depending usually by means, we're talking about your income. A means-tested UBI is called a negative income tax. Uh, now, there are a bunch of other terms. There are a bunch of other terms. And, and, no, those two terms are pretty widely recognized. That UBI means everyone gets it regard of their income. Negative income tax means everyone with low income gets it, but we phase it out as we go to higher income. Um, now, there are a bunch of other terms that are also used, including basic income guarantee, guaranteed adequate income, guaranteed minimum in income, simply minimum income, income guarantee. All of these terms are not well defined. There's not a widely agreed and recognized definition, but usually those terms are used as a branch terms that could refer to either UBI or NIT. Since these, since these two ideas are very similar, these two ideas are very similar, we very, often, uh, we very often need a branch term that refers to both of them. And in fact, one of the things that we're gonna find out here is it's really, it's almost, it, it's impossible to run a true basic income experiment on a small scale. You almost always, either you have to test NIT or the, or the basic income you're, you're experimenting with isn't realistic. And I will talk about why that is a, a lecture or two from now. Now, so what is different about UBI? UBI, what is different about UBI versus the traditional welfare state is very substantial. There are elements of the current system that have all of these things, uh, but, very few of any elements that, that, that have all of these things, you'll find some poly that has it. Um, uh, childhood education is universal. Everybody, almost every country has something where every child is allowed universal education. Uh, however, only Finland has a genuinely universal education system where every kid gets it and every kid must take it. Rich people cannot buy out. Uh, that is more truly universal than uh, than the educational system we we uh, we have. But education is usually considered universal. Most countries have a universal healthcare system where everybody is automatically in the healthcare system. But those are in kind; they're not in cash. So they're like UBI in that sense, but not another sense. Um, most of our welfare system uh, programs are 
non-universal and unconditional. You have to prove that you need it, that you do not have the means to live without it, and you have to prove that you want to work and can't find work, or prove that you're, you've got work, but your work is, doesn't pay enough, or you've got to prove that you're unable to work physically or that you're too old or too young or something like that. Most of our welfare systems like that, unemployment insurance, in order to get unemployment insurance, you have to say that I'm ready, willing, and able to work, but I cannot find work. I'm looking, I can't find work. Um, if you want disability insurance, you have to prove that you are, in fact, disabled. So on. those are conditional. Uh, they might be regular, periodic. Um, we... Uh, um, and then there are others, such as housing assistance, that might be individual and unconditional, but are given, uh, but, uh, that, that are given um, not in cash, but in kind. In the United States, the closest thing we have to a basic income in the United States, in my country, uh, is what we call colloquially food stamps. Um, it's a... And food stamps are, it's almost like giving people money, except for it's a special kind of money that can only be spent on food. And it can only be spent on certain kinds of food. It cannot be served, spent on restaurant food. And it cannot be spent on certain kinds of imported food or luxury foods. And what they count as a luxury and what they don't is really complicated. And they give you this thing. But it is otherwise, it is very much like a negative income tax. It is, it, 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 you do not, at least uh, they're talking about changing this, but you do not at current time have to prove anything to get food stamps in the United States, except that your income is low. And so that is like a universe, uh, it's like a basic income or an NIT, um, except that it's not in cash. So we have things that resemble all of these, all of these five features exist in some things in welfare states we're familiar with, but one policy that has them all is almost entirely absent in the world today. Um, the Alaska dividend, which is which has been under attack recently, the state of Alaska does have a yearly basic income that's very small. Um, whether that is a basic income or not is a judgment. It is yearly regular enough to consider it periodic, and it changes each year. Um, now, um, that is the closest thing to a basic income that really exists in the world today. There are also some countries have citizens' pensions where everyone gets the same pension from the government once they reach a certain age. That's periodic, cash, individual, and in some sense, it's unconditional and universal. Every human being who lives long enough will get it. Um, so that is close to a UBI, but it's only for people that we presume are too old that we should hold them to a work requirement. So it's really uh, not what you would call a UBI. We have other countries that have given out one-time grants. During the 2008 recession and the 2002 recession, uh, the United States gave, and the, and the 2020 recession, during those last three recessions in the United States, the United States gave, gave out direct cash grants to almost everybody. But not quite everybody. They gave it to everybody who had filed a tax return the previous year, which means the poorest people in the world, the homeless, uh, they didn't get it. So we gave it to everybody except the poorest people, the people who absolutely needed it most. We left them out. Um, but otherwise, it was, it was quite a bit like a one-time UBI, but that was one time. It wasn't periodic. Um, now, um, many people believe that basic income should have an additional property, the basic income should be large enough to live on. How much is large enough to live on is a controversial question. Uh, I do support a basic income that is large enough to live on. However, I recognize something that meets these five characteristics and is too small to live on is a basic income. Uh, it is just not one that's not as large as I'd like to see it. All right. So, that's a definition of basic income. Let me start with some history of basic income. It is largely a new idea. You can find some precursors in 
pre-industrial society. Uh, most nomadic hunting and gathering societies had two things that are actually very similar to basic income. One is everybody could go out and hunt and gather if they wanted to. Um, whereas today, you can't do that. If, uh, if I want to go out and hunt and gather, I will be a uh, hunt and gather and live my life uh, tenting, uh, tenting out here in the Black Forest and hunting the animals that I find and gathering uh, the, uh, gathering the whatever plants will keep me alive, I will sooner or later get arrested unless I'm very good at evading the police. Uh, but at one time in human history, every single human being had a guarantee of access to the land. It was universal, it was unconditional, it was periodic, it was everything else, but not in cash. And many, many agricultural societies had this, uh, uh, often we would call this peasant agriculture, but until the colonial period, when, when European or people of European ancestry went around conquering of the world and saying, we're going to create this property rights system where a few people own the property and everyone else will work for those people. M many people around the world had a system where if you lived in a village, you had direct access to the land and you could farm for yourself. And it was unconditional. It was unconditional in that sense. And what do you find in hunting and nomadic hunting gathering communities and in peasant agricultural communities, you actually have a second thing that is like basic income, which is people tended to help each other. If you were a member of this community, you had access to the land that you could farm or hunt on, but also the other members of the community, if you, if you find yourself without, would share with you. Um, but neither of those, so those are, those do some of the things we want basic income to do to make sure everybody's basic needs are met and nobody is held to this difficult responsibility. However, they are not basic income because they're not in cash. These are not cash economies. Uh, there was something like a basic income actually in ancient Greece where, uh, where they, uh, they had a joint mine, a mine that was owned by the city uh, and uh, they actually shared some of the profits of that mine with all the citizens. However, the citizens, citizen means something different better than we think of citizen as a, as a universal term today. But there in ancient Greece, citizens were like the rich, the wealthiest, like 10% of the population. Um, so a, a basic income for the wealthy is not a basic income at all. When you finally start to get people talking about a true basic income is when the enclosure movement in Europe, where they get rid of peasant, where they get rid of uh, peasant agricultural in Europe, and when the colonial movement outside of Europe is going on, when this start, and you've got a cash economy where there are many people that the only way they can live is to get a job for people who own resources. When this starts to happen, then eventually you get a few people who start talking about basic income. The first two people were Payne, Thomas Paine and Thomas Spence, writing in the 1790s. Um, Thomas Paine, the more famous one, he was one of the leading American revolutionaries. Uh, and he was the most radical of the revolutionaries in the United States. Uh, and uh, he was not influential in forming the U.S. Constitution. He was off in France trying to help them with their revolution at the time. Um, so the, the U.S. Constitution doesn't reflect a lot of Thomas Paine's ideas. Uh, Thomas Paine argued for a, one a big one-time grant when you started out in life, and then a citizen's pension when you reached age 55. That would be like a basic income at age 55. And the one-time grant was supposed to be large enough that you could buy a farm and wouldn't have to work for other people unless you wanted to. Uh, so it did some of the functions of a basic income, but it wasn't quite a basic income. But Thomas Spence replied to Thomas Paine. All right, I'm actually conflicted. I always thought it was Thomas Spence was replying to Paine, but I've heard, uh, I've, I've heard conflictual stuff that actually Spence wrote this first. Uh, Thomas, Spence, Thomas Spence criticized Paine for not going far enough, and he went through and said that everyone should get a full income throughout their whole life. So Thomas Spence, this not well-known figure, writing in the 1790s, is the first one, as far as we know, 
At the current state of our knowledge, he's the first one to advocate a true basic income. Maybe someday they'll discover someone earlier who said it, but, uh, uh, but he's the earliest one we know of. Unfortunately, he is not really credited as the inventor of basic income because his writing was not well known. And so most people writing later did not know much about what he was saying. Um, and so they had to reinvent it. And many people did. Uh, Joseph Charlier, writing in Belgium in the 1840s, reinvented it. Um, Henry George, who was an American uh, reformer, uh, advocate for reform, he wasn't really a supporter of basic income, but he kind of mentioned the idea sort of in a footnote of what he was saying. That, oh, and he, is, he had the idea of taxing land and natural resources and as, as high as we possibly can tax them and using that money to help, help poor people. And you say in that way, the tax is going to fall on the landowners and we'll redistribute that to everyone so they can actually afford the housing that the landowners are charging for. Um, and he said, oh, and actually, if, and he wanted to use it for all sorts of government services. And he says, oh, and if, if the government services aren't enough, we have some left over, we could give that in cash. So he did sort of mention basic income. Um, and then, but all of these things were very scattered. And it's really only in the 20th century where you get people starting to talk about basic income in larger numbers. Um, and, and the way I describe it is that over the last hundred years, there have been three waves of support of basic income, each one larger than the last. And the trough between the waves has been lower than the previous trough. There have been three waves of support. The first one is pretty small, and it's in this about a 30-year period from, from say, the, the, the mid-teens, the mid-19-teens to the mid-1940s, where you get Bertrand Russell talking about, you get the author, Virginia Woolf, did a series of lectures called A Room of One's Own, saying that we need a basic income in order to fully emancipate women. There was a group, a, a, a husband and wife team, the Milners, who uh, argued for what they called a state bonus um, in the 1920s, and that was a basic income. A man named Major Douglas, who created a, a whole host of social reforms that he called social credit, that included what he called a national dividend, which was in fact a basic income. An American politician who was actually kind of corrupt and demagogic uh, named Huey Long in Louisiana advocated for what he called share the wealth, which was a form of basic income. And there was a big academic discussion of it in the 1930s and 1940s when he got people including James Mead, Lady Reese Williams, Abba Lerner, Friedrich von Hayek, Oscar Lang, all talking about it. And one of these academics, GDH Cole, is the one who coined the term basic income. Now, but, in the 30s and 40s, it did not catch on. And most, most countries at the end of World War II did want to beef up the welfare system. Uh, the countries that formed the UN, the countries that defeated the Axis powers, uh, most were looking for reform at this time. And so leading up to this period, you have a lot of these academics talking about, let's try this big new thing. But what they tended to do was to go with the traditional model. The traditional model goes back at least to Elizabethan England and what they call the poor laws. Uh, the Bismarckian welfare state, the really first modern welfare state that was started in this country in Germany in what was the 1870s, 1880s, the Bismarckian welfare state. Um, Bismarck's welfare state and what they called the beverage plan in the United Kingdom, which, which was uh, which was recommended by this, uh, uh, the beverage report in 1944, are all based on the model is that people have to prove their work. They have to, if, if they can work, we'll make sure they get good wages. If they prove they can't find work, we'll help them with unemployment insurance. And if they prove they are unable to work for some good reason, then we will help them. Um, that is the system. So people have to prove they deserve it. Basic in, but this, of course, creates a very complex system where we have to evaluate everyone. Why are you poor? Why do you need money? 
And we got, and we have ever since, we've had this very complex system where we are trying to help people, but we're also evaluating them and telling many people, you are not good enough. Go live under the, go live under a bridge. Go live in a tent because you are not good enough to get this money. And that is the system we created and discussion of basic income died down after the 1940s as if people were looking to implement this widely agreed system. But the academic discussion never went away. And in the 1960s, especially in the United States, but to some extent to can in Canada and the UK, this talk started to come back. Um, where, and it was a confluence of many different things. Um, the United States was aware, was, was becoming aware that it had not, with its reforms in the 30s and 40s, had not eliminated poverty. And so you and and so people were talking about what can we do to do better, and people were looking at a, a complete reform of the system. And, a, and that brought a lot of people from different sides coming in for basic income. You have welfare rights act advocates such as Martin Luther King and Francis Fox Piven setting on either a basic income or a negative income tax. Economists like Milton Friedman, uh, Friedrich Hayek, James Tobin, John Kenneth Galbraith, James Buchanan, arguing for some form of guaranteed income. You also had libertarians who were saying, look, look, uh, I'm a libertarian. I hate the poor as much as everybody else. But as long as we have this big complex system, why don't we get rid of the complex system and place it with much, something much simpler like a guaranteed income? You had futurists like Robert Theobald and Eric Fromm, the psychologist, who were talking about automation. Back then, 60 years ago, people were talking about computers are taking people's jobs. We're increasingly automating uh, assembly lines. People are losing their jobs. A way to handle this would be with basic income. And this led to a lot of talk about basic income. Uh, and it did lead to some policies. The Alaska dividend was an offshoot of this discussion. I met the man who most pushed it through, Governor Jay Hammond, before he died. I met him and he said that he was inspired by this talk of a guaranteed income that was going around. Uh, the family assistance plan in the United States uh, was a proposal for, for a form of negative income tax. It was quite watered down and a bit conditional, but it was something moving in that direction. We have something today in the United States, the earned income tax credit. That was an outcome of this discussion. Food stamps were increased at this time as, a, as um, an outcome of this discussion, things that are moving in the direction of this. And then at this time, something new happened. It never happened before, is that we had the first basic income trials. And these were not only the first basic income experiments, but these were the first social science experiments of any kind. A woman who was working at the Office of Economic Opportunity in the Johnson administration in 1966, uh, had this idea of saying, well, you know, we could experiment with this idea. We could give like uh, one or 2,000 people a basic income and see, or a, mostly then they were talking about the negative income tax. We could give one or 2,000 people a negative income tax and see how it affects them. And nobody ever done a major experiment on policy like this before, as far as we know in human history. And they did it. They tried it. So in 1968, they in the United States federal government spent millions of dollars introducing the what they were going to call the New Jersey Income Maintenance Experiment, which uh, then was, they extended it to Pennsylvania. The reason they extended it to Pennsylvania because they wanted to get a broad swath of different ethnic groups, and they couldn't find enough poor white people in New Jersey. Uh, there were a lot of poor black people in New Jersey. But in order to find enough poor white people, I had to go all the way to Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't think demographically that's that's true anymore. I think there's there's plenty of poor white people, poor, poor people of every ethnic group in New Jersey these days. But then it was rather, New Jersey was a rather wealthy suburban state at the time. Um, well, then that was followed by the rural basic income experiment, um, which was conducted in North Carolina and Iowa. Um, started a little bit North, yeah, North Carolina and Iowa. Uh, and then they had uh, the Gary, the city of Gary, uh, city of Gary's income maintenance experiment, which was on all of these are run by the U.S. 
federal government, with federal financing. Uh, there was an experiment in Gary that focused mostly on single mothers. And then the largest experiment was what they called Syme Dime. Syme slash sideways slash dime. And that stands for the Seattle Denver Income Maintenance Experiment. Uh, Syme Seattle Income Maintenance Experiment, Dime Denver Income Maintenance Experiment. And while the United States was doing this, Canada got in on the act. They started a little bit early. Canada's experiment didn't start until 1975. And it was called MINCOM, the Manitoba Income Maintenance Experiment, MINCOM for short. And it was an interesting experiment because it included a saturation site where they gave one town. They found they had a random control trial in the city. And then they get, took one little town and gave everybody in that town access to a negative income tax. Um, but by the late 70s, this, this, search for reform and improvement of the welfare system was running out of steam. And you had politicians like Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom who was tending to blame the poor for their own condition and to condemn almost anyone who is eligible. Oh, if you're eligible for this stuff, you must be cheating somehow. I well, we've had this system going back to the Elizabethan poor laws that judges people before it gives them anything. But the belief is that the market system is so good and fair and just that if you're actually eligible, you're probably not really trying. And so they vilified people who were, who were meeting the eligibility requirements for just, for just about everything. And that gave them the impetus to cut. And this led to a big decline in, in, in discussion of reform on both sides of the political spectrum. In the especially in the United States, but also very largely in England and in Canada and other places as well. And that was because if you were to admit, the people on the left were thinking, if you were to admit there's anything wrong with the existing welfare system, then you are admitting that these people who are criticizing it are right. And the people who are criticizing it, all they want to do is cut it. So you, you're Politically, there were people who were defending the system is just fine as it is, and people saying the system's terrible, let's get rid of it and replace it with nothing. Uh, and a talk of reforming it and make it better and more comprehensive through a basic income was dead, especially in the United States and the UK. Uh, and, um, and this went on for a very long time. This went on for the in the United States, Canada, and and the and uh in the United Kingdom, it went on for a long time. And this was exactly when I came in to the system. I was 15 years old on my 15th birthday on February 7th, 1980. And I saw a documentary by Milton Friedman, where on that day, the one that aired on my 15th birthday, we talked about the solution to poverty. And he talked about a negative income tax. And I'm like, wow, this, is, this really works. And it's so not judgmental. It's a way to really care for people. And I didn't know that his version of negative income tax was actually very, very low and um, kind of punitive. I would like something more generous, but I've been a supporter of that since February 7th, 1980. Um, at 15, of course, I had to go to high school and all these things, but also at this, but of course, he, even in the television show, was very pessimistic about the prospects of this, whereas 20 years earlier, he'd written a book where he was very optimistic about the prospects for a negative income tax. Now he was very pessimistic because, well, times had changed, and he was right. It was getting politically marginalized. The very idea was politically marginalized in the United States shortly after that, and uh, whereas 10 years Earlier, people were calling the guaranteed income the next step in social policy. And now it's out of the mainstream in the US. Um, and it, it was so out of the mainstream that um, the results of the negative income tax experiments were vilified and were, and were declared as, oh, it, it, all these results show that we should never have basic income. That was the main talk in the media. And we'll talk about that next week. But it got to the point where in Canada, 
It was so bad that they actually, they collected all this data. They spent three years and millions of dollars collecting data in this Mincom experiment. And then they decided to cancel it. After the experiment was done, they collected all the data, the experiment's over, it's time to analyze the data. And they say, now we're gonna cancel this. So they took all the data they collected, and this is, computers were such a big deal. So they put it in file cabinets, they put it in file folders in 1980, and it sits there. Something's gonna happen with that, that's foreshadowing for later. So, uh, so then, uh, as this wave of support died in the United States, Canada, and the UK, it did start to spread elsewhere. In some places in Europe, it started to crop up from time to time. It was talked about in the 19, late 70s and 80s in Denmark and in, and, and in the Netherlands. Um, and then in, uh, in the middle of the 1980s, a group of activists, including Guy Standing, Philippe von Parijs, uh, uh, Annie Miller, um, and several others put together an academic group called the Basic Income European Network, which, is, which had its first meeting in 1986. And it had little meetings every couple of years, and it got, they got larger and larger over time, and people started putting together academic networks for basic income around the world. Um, so this academic discussion is starting to increase even as, even as it, the idea is becoming marginalized, and other things are happening. You occasionally get small parties, such as the Green Party or the Left Party, might endorse basic income in, a, in, in various places, and you do get little waves of support in various places, like a, around the a, in the early post-apartheid era, there was a lot of discussion of basic income in South Africa, which subsequently died off. By, uh, now, for me, I had to go through high school and then college, and then I went to graduate school and I got a PhD in economics, none of which, uh, so by 1996, I'd been a supporter of basic income for 16 years, but I'd never written a thing about it. I was now, instead of 15, let's say I'm 31 at this point, 31 years old, and uh, I'm sitting around with a couple of friends of mine who are also academics who are finishing up their PhDs. And we're talking about, we're talking about social reform. And uh, we, well, what's one thing we can agree on? And I, I got them to agree that the reform we need most is basic income. So one of them, Pamela Donovan, uh, Pamela Donovan uh, said, well, then the three, and we all agreed on it. And she said, we need to write a paper about it. So we started working on a paper together. Actually, Pam Donovan is the one who said we should write the paper, ended up dropping out. Michael Lewis and I finished the paper together. And both of us have been writing on basic income on and off ever since. So I've, I've, although I've, su I've supported basic income for over 40 years, I've been writing about it for about 25 years. And it took me three years to get my first publication on it. So I didn't start talking about it till 1999, but I did get in one publication in the 1990s. So I can say I've been writing about this since the 20th century. Uh, so um, now, and I even by, by 1996, I was not aware that there was, this is, you know, this before the internet. Uh, I was not aware that there, is, there was a 10 year old group called the Basic Income European Network. Um, I was not aware of it all. I was writing on it. And then in 1998, a colleague of mine where I was working at the time at the, at the Levy Institute in upstate New York told me about this group. And they were having a conference in ne the Netherlands that fall. So in 1998, I went to my first basic income European network. And I was actually in a room full of people who all supported basic income, which was really novel at the time. And I got more involved. Michael Lewis and I, along with several other people, co-founded the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network. And these, these networks were cropping up all over the places. We were still very marginalized from the mainstream. And it did not feel like that marginalization was on its way out. 
It did not feel like we were about to break through from the mainstream because we've been working on it for a long time by the mid, by say 2006. It did not feel like we were any less marginalized, but getting all these academics and some activists talking about it was beginning to have its effect. And things like those started to happen together at the same time. Um, There started to be enough uh, activists that somebody actually went out and did activism for basic income. So the first thing, and the guy who did that was the guy who gave me these mics that didn't work. The guy who was in here just a a few minutes ago, uh, most of you were here when when he was here giving me these microphones. That's Eno Schmidt. In 2006, he and about a half a dozen other people in Switzerland, I think it was right over in Basel, right nearby, um, uh, he led... Um, he led uh, a very small uh, public activist thing promoting basic income. And I was like, it's great that they're doing that. I don't know that anybody's going to, it's going to have any effects. But he did that. But after that, then the German speaking countries, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany got together and created International Basic Income Week which is now not limited to German-speaking countries and all over the world, activism started to happen. And Evelyn Forger, a Canadian from the University of Manitoba, got a grant. This is about 2006. A grant to open up those files that have been sitting in file folders somewhere in Manitoba for the last 16 years and started analyzing them and wrote an article about the town without poverty that got lots of media attention. Then implementation, then at the 2006 meeting of the Basic Income Now Earth Network, and by the time I've been, this is now I've been going for eight years, I'm, not no, I'm no longer the new kid at the meeting. I'm actually one of the committee members. Uh, and uh, at this meeting in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, I think it was our first meeting outside of Europe, in fact, uh, the bishop of the Namibian Lutheran Church got up on the podium in front of everyone and he said, words, 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 we need to do something. Now, this saying, words, words are not enough, we need to do something, is nothing new. What People are, would, would be saying that all the time back then, but they would be, when they did that, it would usually it would be followed by, okay, you all need to do what I think. Okay, I, I, I've got this plan. If you follow my plan, you guys put in the work, then, then, then that's going to be more than words. Uh, but, but Bishop Kamita didn't, he, he didn't follow it up that way. He said, as the head of the Lutheran Namibian church, which is a big deal uh, in Namibia, uh, he said, I have been raising money to conduct a basic income trial in Namibia. And that began, and he was actually, most of the way he had the money mostly raised. And he began this trial, he and his organization, the basic income uh, big, the big coalition, the Basic Income Grant Coalition of Namibia, they raised enough money to give a small town of about a thousand people, very impoverished people in rural Namibia, they gave them uh, a grant that was equivalent of about 15, maybe $16 a month. Very small grant. But to people that poor, it made a very big difference. It lasted for two years from 2008 to 2010. And it got international media attention. Then India started its basic income project just after that one finished in 2011. India started a two-year project. And at this time, we're going through, we had the financial meltdown of 2008, followed by the Great Recession that started in 2009 and lasted for well into the 20-teens. This and we had the Arab Spring and other things. And this got activism going. And these activists were not looking to rebuild the welfare state from the 1960s. Can you still hear me? 
Andrea, good. They were not re looking to rebuild Lyndon Johnson's welfare state. They were looking for something new. And a lot of these activists looked at basic income. So you got citizens as initiatives in the European Union and in Switzerland, both of which raised lots of signatures, raised awareness. Neither of them created basic income. Neither of them created basic income, but both of them got lots of media attention to it. And you've got environmentalists saying, look, we need to tax things that are polluting the, the world and, and, and creating global warming and the other dangerous forms of pollution. We need to tax those. But when we tax those, we're getting money out of the economy. That's going to put a big, big drag on the economy. How do we keep, how do we introduce all these new taxes we need to discourage global warming and other forms of pollution? Without putting a big drag on the economy, you put it back into the economy with a dividend for everyone. That's a basic income. The tax, the tax and dividend approach to global warming involves a basic income. You had, um, you had um, many lesser developed countries easing their conditions for redistributive programs, which, which were they're calling conditional cash transfers. This is not a basic income, but it's a step closer by, by, by making the conditions less harsh. Uh, you got then the concern with automation that was so big in the 1960s, has been gone for so long, comes back with the Great Recession. And you start to get journalists writing about it, and you start to get activism that really looks like activism, the people out on the street talking about basic income and a renewed poor's people campaign. Then in the United States, we had someone who actually ran for president and made a big splash, Andrew Yang, running on a platform where basic income was the central idea. Um, and all of this created, and, and, and as soon as Yang dropped out of the race, we had the COVID epidemic and we're telling people for years and years and years, we've been telling people, you've got to get out and work or you don't get anything. You got to prove, you got to work or prove you can't or you don't deserve anything. We're saying, we're saying stay home. We're saying, oh, sorry, everybody's got to stay home. Everybody's got to stay home. Uh, there's this dangerous virus out there. Please stay home for a while. And suddenly, well, if you won't let people work, then you ought to be able to give them, except for the essential workers, then you ought to be giving them some money. It was the very opposite of the thing. This all gave new impetus. And this is what's created what I've called the third wave of basic income. It's really been rising. It's been gradually rising since maybe as long ago as 1986, talk of basic income. But it appeared in the mainstream sometime in the last 10 years, and it keeps rising. And what this... And, and experiments, the experiment in Namibia, the experiment in India, and the revived, uh, the revived information that came out of Mincom that was done, that was done in the 1970s, but not reported until until recently. Those experiments helped spark this third wave of basic income support, and by far the largest and most worldwide wave of support basic income has ever had. It, they both, they sparked it. Those three is helped to spark it. However, now there are many more experiments going on around the world. There was one in Finland. There's a huge one in Kenya. There's, there was one in Stockton, California, at, which concluded a couple of years ago. And now it's been followed by 30 more experiments in the United States alone. They've got other variations. The experiments, all of these many experiences are happening because we're having a wave of support of basic income. But however, these experiments, as they come and get reported on, also attract people to the idea. A basic income experiment is both an outcome and, and an input into the political process. And you can't understand the science of the basic income experiments until you understand that role that it plays. It is an outcome of the political process and it is an input in the political process, even if the experiment is good science. All right, that's the history. That's the history that I wanna talk about. That's the history that we're dealing with this. this we've had, we had five large federally government-run experiments in the United States and Canada in the 1970s. We had two small ones at the beginning of what I'm calling this third wave of basic income support. One 
in Namibia and one in India. And those were different than the ones in the United States because they were happening when there was no big wave of support and they were not led by a government that was, that was responding to a big wave of support. They were led by activists who raised money and then got some government grants to help them out. But they were not primarily government-led. And they were, they were not primarily government-led, and they were something that the people who were doing it were really knew very well that they were doing this in order to, in order to promote basic income and get it back into the mainstream discussion. Now that basic income has been part of the political discussion around the world in many countries for five years or more at this point, uh, now we're having all kinds of experiments all around the world. Most of them, though, are not like those 70s experiments, those big federally government finance projects with, with uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars in budget to do a really big project. They tend to be small, tend to be run by local governments, subsidized by private donations, um, or, and subsidized, uh, or sometimes subsidized by the federal government. The uh, exception to that is the Finnish experiment, which is, the Finnish experiment is rather large, uh, and was rather large and was run by the Finnish federal government. Uh, and, the, and the Namibian experiment is privately funded, but it is the largest experiment in the world, mostly because it doubles as a charity. It's a way to help people. And uh, they're helping some of the poorest people in the world. So a little money goes a long way. In Kenya, they can afford to run a big experiment because they're getting enough donations that they can provide a basic income for about 10,000 people. It's, it's a big project that's going on down there. Right, so that's the history of basic income over the 20th century and how experiments have played a role in that. Uh, that is, and that history, because these experiments are so tied to the political process, is something you'll have to keep in mind throughout this course, throughout your work on this course. How do these experiments, how are they being affected by the political process and how are they in turn affecting the political process? That is something we have to think about. I talked about my role in this. I could say a little more about um, I. I was I was chair of I was chair of the Basic Income Earth Network. I think for about seven years. I think it's 2010 to 2017. Uh, I was co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network, and I was on the committee before that. I also was uh, heavily involved. In U.S. Big and some of the early conferences we have we had there, um, I have since 2017 I've gotten out of my administrative role and I focus entirely on writing. I've been writing about basic income since 1996, but working on these this administrative stuff, um, I have uh, working on this administrative stuff has been uh, it, it got to be too cumbersome and I needed the time to just devote to writing, whereas where I think I can make my best contribution, I am. I don't consider myself a, a leader as activist. I'm a, maybe I'm a leader among the people who uh, who research this idea. But as, as far as activists go, I'm a follower. If an activist is having a march and they want me to march, I'll march. If they want me to speak, I'll speak. But as far as how to organize effective act activism, that's you got to ask Eno for that. Eno knows how to do that. I don't. Um, that's not my thing. Um, and, and I did. I. Um, uh, at the time that Evelyn Forge was writing The Town Without Poverty, I also wrote an article called A Failure to Communicate, uh, which we'll be reading for next week, uh, The Labor Market Findings of the Negative Income Tax Experiments, where I took a, I, I took a broader, more critical view about what they, what they showed. Whether that had any effect on uh, the subsequent wave of support, I would, I would rather doubt. But uh, it's it's interesting that I go to ba I go to basic income conferences and uh, people gave me give me way more credit than I deserve. It's kind of it, it, kind of like wow you you uh, you know you this thing is this big deal worldwide. You've been writing on it since the twentieth century. Well, and, and so people think it must be because of you and Philippe and these people who have 
Oh, that must be why this is happening. I can't, I don't think any of us can take any credit for it. Uh, we were writing on it and then it took off. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a causal connection. I would credit it more to the activists, but I would also credit it more to the times is that uh, the times were right. Uh, if I had to, you know, if I had to, if I had to pick anything to spark it, I would say Bishop Kamita uh, and the experiment in Namibia. Um, but I don't, it's not just one thing. It's a it's a coalition of many many different things. And the fact that uh, that I was sitting there typing doesn't mean I can grab any credit whatsoever for the support UBI uh, UBI has gained in the years. Okay, so that's the history. Next, I want to talk about how we're addressing these experiments. But do you have any questions or discussion about the history while I'm at it? Um, you have to remind me your name. You have to remind me your name like every time. Miharika. Miharika, okay. Um, so I wanted to ask, like, I believe the most broader argument against basic income is that it would cause inflation. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, like, the film experiments which are um, funded by, like, which are privately funded, mm -hmm. how far would they, like, or would they do, like, even some extent explain the inflation part, if at all, the privately funded? Um, Absolutely not. Okay, uh, we'll get to that. And, and that's one of the, the big questions about basic income. And like many of the biggest questions about basic income, that is something that a field experiment cannot address. It cannot, no field experiment can address that question because that's a macroeconomic question. It does not happen on a smaller scale. Uh, you can, the only way to test that would be have, would, would be, would be, uh, would be uh, would be to get have thirty different countries uh, getting basic income and thirty different countries in your control group. Uh, so if you had sixty countries in the world yeah. experimenting with it over say ten years, twenty years, then you could learn quite a bit about it, right. but not on any realistic experiment. But uh, uh, questions like that, we're going to cover questions like that. That's like kind of more broader to the whole course. Anything that's really specific to what I've said in the first hour of this course. Me. Oh, oh, Andrea. Okay. Uh, okay. Andrea is online. She will be back soon. Um, okay. Andrea, what's your question? My question is about the Canadian results, the one that they stopped. Yeah. Why did they stop it? And what did the results show? You, you said you had access, I mm -hmm. mean, people had access to it after some years. Yeah. Why did they invest it so much? And then they decided to just put it away. Was it showing like negative results on the people was there was no impact or well happened? this is actually this has happened twice in canada now this has happened twice in canada that uh i don't know why canada this is it's is, it's fair to fact as far as I, I know this has only happened in canada it's only happened in canada twice um that is that they start a big basic income experiment and then cancel it before it's finished um and it's, it, it happened then, and the reason it was canceled was because there was a change in government. And the government decided it didn't want to keep doing it. It was opposed to the idea to begin with, and it didn't want to, it, 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 what they claimed was the whole thing was a waste of money from the start. We never should have done it. What their opponents said, and what I'd like to believe, which was they were afraid of the results, um, and they canceled it. Well, you know, it's better to say the whole thing was a washout than actually hear these results that might actually be uh, be good results. I probably, it probably was not the second one because the U.S. experiments had come out, uh, had come out already. Most of them, the results had come out and those results were not well received uh, as we'll talk about next week. Um, so it was canceled, but it was canceled because Political power and public opinion were moving away from reform and improvement of our social support system. And it was canceled. It was it was canceled to uh, it was it was it was canceled because you had a government that was less sympathetic to reform. Uh, so uh, so it was uh, uh, so it was really a political thing that canceled and that happened again. During this second wave, a few years ago, 
there was a major experiment in Ontario. It was read, run not by the federal government, at least not primarily by the Canadian federal government, but the, uh, the Ontario government. Now, for those of you who don't know, Ontario is, there's basically in Canada, there's two big provinces, Quebec and Ontario, and then there's a whole bunch of small provinces. Ontario is one of the biggest, it is bigger than, in land, in land wise, I think it's bigger than Germany, uh, but in population, it's going to be bigger, it's going to be bigger than Belgium, probably bigger than Belgium and Netherlands put together. It's a pretty big state. Um, so um, it's a big set. I don't know the exact population. I can't remember the population of Belgium and Netherlands. Maybe it's smaller than those two put together. I don't know, but it's a big place. So they've got a decent budget. And they were able to do a fairly large experiment in response to the support that basic income is getting around the world. And, and in Ontario, they do this large experiment and there's an election coming up. So the government that runs the election gets the opposition to say, to promise that if we win, if the opposition wins, we'll keep the experiment going. The opposition won. And one of the first things the opposition did once they won was to go back on their promise, was to go back on their promise and cut the experiment. This time they cut the experiment, not after the data collection and before the analysis, but actually in the middle of the data collection, which what they did then, that was a horrible move. It was actually probably a smart move in 1980 when they canceled the Manitoba one, uh, because, uh, because Basekin was on decline and there was nobody really seemed to care that much when they canceled it. But here, basic income in, in a few years ago when they canceled the Ontario project, basic income was growing in popularity. And they'd not given out all of the benefits. So they'd gotten, I don't know, several hundred, maybe a few thousand people to join this experiment and say, we promise that if you take place in this experiment, if you take part in this experiment, you will get a basic income for the next three years. And they cancel it after a year and a half, cutting off a bunch of really poor people and making themselves look so horrible. So it was actually, strangely enough, the Ontario cancelization was as horrible it was what it did for those people. It was actually a boost to the basic income movement because it made basic income opponents look like stingy, selfish people who go back on their word. Um, and it also created a bunch of activists. A lot of those people who were receiving that basic income didn't know what basic income was before they got involved in this project. And a lot of them are now leading activists in Canada. Uh, there's a woman who does basic income pictures, uh, which uh, does some really good stuff. And she's been, uh, she's gone all the way to Hyderabad, India to talk about basic income, thanks to her project, the project she was just a recipient of being canceled. Um, so anyway, uh, okay, so that's, that's, why, that's why the cancellation of it was. And we'll talk about the findings of the Mincom experiment. We'll talk about those uh, next week and, and uh, subsequently. All right, any other questions about this history? Um, uh, Anu, yeah. uh, just like Australian National University. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what led them to come back and continue the project? Oh no, it was two different projects. Okay. Uh, one was in Manitoba and the other one was in, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, two, uh, two very big projects. Um, and, uh, uh, they were, and they were also, um, they were also about 40 years apart. So you mentioned that there was someone in the middle who got a grant to go back to the- Oh, area. okay. Oh yeah. So that was Evelyn Forge. Mm -hmm. That was Evelyn Forge. So, uh, the first project, the Manitoba Mincom project, they had done, they had all of this data, but very little analysis of it done in, done by 1980. Then in 20, in 2005, just through some other source, she got a grant to go in and look at that, look at that data and publish findings about it. So I don't even know what source her data was. Uh, and, but she got that data and she published her findings, she also published that. So a lot of other people have come out reanalyzing the income findings as well. And it's not that I, when I say they canceled it before the data analysis, I should say that they, they canceled it before the full data analysis. Some in the late 70s and 80s, some, 
some findings from Mincom were published at the time. But the one that really made a big political impact was the one that came out of nowhere uh, with Evelyn Forge in the mid 2000s. Okay, um, uh, Anna. Yes. No, we will talk about the reason why next week is that most of these experiments end up testing negative income tax, even if what they're interested in is basic income, because basic income doesn't lend itself to testability as much as negative income tax does. And actually, the testability of negative income tax is pretty limited, too. Um, what um, and it's a bit. The, the, I'll explain this next week. That the the reasons for that are a bit technical, and I'll I'll have a full lecture where we talk about that kind of stuff. Um, there have been give directly, uh, give directly, and in Kenya and the Namibian experiment and the Indian experiments were the closest to following a true basic income model. And all of those have one thing in common. Those are all countries where you can find really, really poor people and that they focused on really, really poor people. Uh, it's much easier to test basic income when you have a, when, when you have a country where there, there are many, many poor people. And I'll explain why that is later. Okay, any other questions on this before I go on? Okay, let me move on to... Uh, to this, uh, the rest of this section really is going to be a preview of the class. This, I think probably many of you were hoping for a class in economics where we were going to look at a lot of regression analysis and say, what did they report in these things? How do you conduct these? How do you get people a controlled experimental group and so forth? That's really not what this is about. This is not a class about statistics or anything like that. We're not gonna be talking about a lot of T statistics and confidence intervals. We're not gonna be talking about much of this. This is mostly a class in the philosophy of science, the philosophy specifically of social science, the philosophy of economics. I define, based on several different sources, I define the philosophy of science as the study of the methodology of science, the implications of science, the use and the use and merit of scientific findings. So we're really not so much doing science is talking about how science works. What is a good scientific methodology? What is a bad scientific methodology? That question I'm much more interested in as, as then how much did the control and the experimental group work in this particular in this particular experiment? What are the implications of it? Okay, well, if the control group did this and the experimental group did that, what does that say for the policy that we're really trying to test? How are these results going to be used? And are they going to be used in a scientific way? Or are they going to be simply demagogue? Are they going to be spun? Are they going to be understood by people? What is the merit of these findings? Are these findings really useful? If you're going to conduct a scientific experiment on a policy, I mean, the motivation should be for that, the motivation for that policy should be that we can learn something about this policy so that we can make a more informed decision about whether or not to introduce it. And sadly, that's not always how these experiments are being used by everyone. And that might not even be something that these experiments are very capable of doing, of really answering the big questions we wanna know about basic income. What do experiments actually tell us? And it's, well, it's not much. They do give some indications about some important things about basic income. But they don't answer all of our most important questions about basic income. The reasons that we disagree about basic income, most of them are not resolved by anything we can learn from experiment. So we disagree now, we will disagree after the results come out, and we'll disagree about what the results mean. 
Um, so we're doing this. If they can't address the big questions, uh, or, and, and even the questions that they can address, where they can tell us something useful, their answers are usually incomplete, and they're examining what we want to know real, rather indirectly, and they often bring in significant bias. Not bias in the sense of favoring advantage groups, but bias in the sense of the, the answer is more likely to go this direction than that direction, uh, even if uh, it, 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 uh, it's more likely to overestimate than, under, than underestimate is statistical bias. It's more likely to underestimate than overestimate. That's statistical bias. It has nothing to do with favoring advantage groups. Now, none of this would be a problem. The limits of experiments would not be a problem if everyone understood the limits. But, the, but that is the biggest problem, is that most people do not understand the limits of experiments. They do not understand what they can test, what they can't test. The average layperson's experiment, uh, uh, understanding of what an experiment, they, they think an experiment is like a, a test in school. They think you're going to, like, you know, you go in, you're, you say, in, in uh, spelling class, in when, you're, when you're 10 years old, you go in, you take a test, and they say, you've passed the test. You'll get promoted to go on to learn more vocabulary. Or, or they'll say, you've failed the test. You have to do it again. They think about something. Uh, they think about it being a January test where you can tell them whether it passed or failed. What is your verdict? Does basic income pass or does it fail? These tests can't do that. And yet most people expect them to do. And even people you would think would know better often don't understand this. As I mentioned in the book, in December of 2016, an article in the MIT Technology Review, that is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the most prestigious scientific universities in the United States with an excellent economics department. An article in, in one of their publications called Technology Review had the headline, in 2017, we will find out if basic income makes sense. Now, this was bad for a number of reasons. One reason this was a bad headline was the test was just starting in 2017. They, were gonna, they weren't even going to publish most of the results until 2020. Uh, so uh, so it, was, it didn't even have the timing wrong. But the hubris of this author of thinking that any social science test can actually tell you actually tell you whether this policy makes sense is simply false and that is and, and that is true that that that, um, that is something that sets social science experiments apart from medical experiments well there might be some social science experiments where you can get definitive answers i can't think of any but certainly not with basic income uh, for reasons uh, like you already brought up, that it can't measure things we want to know, like inflation. Uh, there are many things like that that it can't measure. But now, so about a um, a test of a vaccine. Test of a vaccine compared to test of basic income is really simple. You divide people in two. You make sure it's random. Of half the people get the vaccine. Half the people don't get the vaccine. Then you let them go out in the real world and say, are the people who got the vaccine less likely to get the disease we're trying to vaccinate them against? And are they more likely to get some dangerous side effect? That works really well. And we know a lot in a big hurry. We know a lot. We know a lot that the Moderna vaccine is way better than Sinovac. We learned that in a big hurry through these kind of trials. You can't do that with basic income because most of the things we want to know don't happen at the individual level. They happen at the community level. Well, you separate people into random groups and you want to know how does it affect the whole system. So let, let, me, let me give you an example. I think we'll explain this to you. So let's say, um, let's say um, 
let's say you have uh, a thousand, well, you have, how many auto workers do you think there are in, in Germany these days? I don't know. Let's say there's 10,000 auto workers in Germany. I don't know how many. People who work for, for Volkswagen, BMW, um, Audi, you know, the big German companies. I don't know. Let's say 10,000 people. Were, let's say they're thinking about, will a strike, could a strike help us get, uh, could, could going on strike help us get higher wages? Well, you know what you need to do to go on strike? You need all 10,000 workers to stay home and pressure all these three big international car companies with loss of profits while no cars are being made. That's how strikes raise wages. Well, what if you took, um, what, what if you said, okay, we're going to experiment to see if striking works. So out of those 10,000 workers across the country, we're going to take uh, an experimental group of 100 workers, and we're going to take uh, we're going to take a control group of 100 workers, randomly spread out at all of the different automobile manufacturers around Germany, and we're going to have these 100 stay out. They're they're going to go on strike, spread out around the country, and these won't. And how how is that going to affect their wages? Well, we know how that's going to happen. It will have no effect on the wages whatsoever. A company could just replace 100 workers. You can't do it on that scale. Well, a lot because the effect of a labor strike is a community wide effect. Well, many of basic incomes effects are community wide effects, and they won't show up in a random control trial. They won't even show up in a saturation study that an income had in the little town of Dauphin, Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, Dauphin, Manitoba. Uh, I was so concerned about pronouncing dolphin right. It is dolphin. Sounds like dolphin, but it's not dolphin. It's dolphin. Dolphin is French for the crown prince, the son of the king who will replace the king. That's uh, and it's actually it's pronounced dauphin in French, but they call it dolphin, Minnesota. So it ends up sounding like dolphin. I was very concerned about pronouncing, not saying dolphin, but I said I got it dolphin, Minnesota. But then I but. Then I said Minnesota instead of Manitoba. So I mixed up the one, the word I wasn't concentrating on. Anyway, um, and so experiments can't test some of these big community effects, but they can test some things. And they can give some indication of which direction these big community effects are going to go in. But there's this huge gap in conducting the experiment getting the results between these experimental groups, and then using that to improve your understanding of where these big community effects are going to go. That gap in understanding really is what this class is all about. How does that, how do we bridge that gap? How do we as scientists, you're all master students in economics, so you're a part of the, you're no longer part of the lay people here. How do we as scientists understand this gap ourselves? And once we understand it, how do we communicate it to lay audiences? And, and, and the lay audiences will include not only, in, not only individuals who, go, who, are, who are arguing on social media about whether we should introduce this policy or not, but it also includes it includes politicians who will make these decisions who are lay people themselves. They're, most politicians are not scientists. And it also includes intermediaries such as journalists, like the guy writing for MIT Technology Review, who's not, who is going to be writing about all kinds of technology. He's not going to be a specialist in every one of them. And that person is also a lay person. How can we, the scientists, help? those people understand better. And what are the arguments I give is, is that our limits to do that are very strong. Our limits are very strong. There's no list of caveats that you give people. Okay, the experience, we divided people in experimental and control group, but, but we can't do this, can't do that, can't do the other thing. We can do this. And when we do this, we've got to use this proxy to figure out this other thing. You can have this list of caveats. People's eyes will gloss over and they will skip that section or they will not understand that section. No list of caveats is going to bridge that gap. How do we bridge that gap? Well, that brings us to another question. If there's such a limit, there's such a gap between, there's a gap 
between what experience can show us and what we really want to know. And then there's a gap between that, what the experiments do indicate about what we not want to know, and what the typical individual who's reading the results in the newspaper about these experiments, how there's a gap between how well they will understand that initial gap. So there's really two gaps we're talking about here, two enormous and big important gaps. Given that these things exist, why are we studying this problem? Why are we using this method to study this problem? And we're doing it with increasing frequency. Why are we doing this? Well, there are good reasons and there are bad reasons to be conducting a UBI experiment. The demand, when you look, I don't know how closely most of you have been following the news about basic income, but when you look, at people talking about an experiment, having a basic income experiment, they usually sound like they want a basic income experiment for the sake of having a basic income experiment. Uh, we, one function, one function that those 1970s experiments might have played in the basic income debate in the 1970s might have been as a consolation prize for the people who really supported a negative income tax back then. Say, well, okay, this year, we're not gonna get your negative income tax through, through Congress. We're not gonna be able to pass that. But I tell you, what, we're moving that direction, we're gonna have an experiment. So it's like a consolation prize. So you're a politician, you've got some basic income supporters. You don't support basic income, but you want basic income supporters to support you. Okay, we'll have an experiment with it. And it'll take five years. So you can get off my back about introducing basic income for the next five years. Could be a consolation prize. And it could be, but there is, well, okay. But it's not just a consolation prize. Because if there is, the basic income supporters have been foolish for it. They've been foolish for falling for it. Over. It is, Basic income supporters have continued to support the idea of having it, partly because basic income is still outside the mainstream. Is that basic income supporters know that they don't have the support to get basic income passed tomorrow, and they're grasping at well, what can we do that may increase support? And there has been some history. There's been a mixed history of whether basic income experiments increase or decrease support for basic income. In the 1970s, I would say most of the results actually had a negative effect. By the time they came out, negative, negative income tax was already in decline in popularity in the US and Canada. But they actually, the way the results were treated in the media, I would say that the results of the experience actually hastened the decline of basic income in that period, in the late 1970s. However, in that period from 2005, when Evelyn Forget was writing, when I don't know if mine had any effect, but when I was writing and reevaluating the old experiments, and then when the new experiments started happening in Namibia and India, Namibia and India had almost an unequivocally positive effect on the basic income movement in their local countries and worldwide, because at that time there was no wave of support. It was just, or at least the very beginning wave of support, and it brought attention to it. That's one reason they're doing it. But those are not science, neither of those are scientific reasons. What you don't get, you, what a scientific reason to have an experiment is to say, well, we all agree, the people who support this and oppose this all agree that, that we need to learn this thing about it. If we knew this about it, then we would introduce it. Uh, and uh, like, you know, uh, uh, when, uh, when, the, when, the COVID, uh, when, the, when the COVID vaccine started coming out, there were millions of people who were millions, billions of people around the world said, I would love to take a COVID vaccine if I know that it's safe and I know that it's effective. So let's have an experiment. If the experiment shows that it's safe and effective, I'll get the, I'll get the experiment. I'll get the, uh, a million, a billion other people will get the vaccine and others won't. 
oh, well, get the vaccine. And if it is not safe and effective, it won't. I won't. And that those experiments did exactly what, yeah, and that's exactly the way experiments work. Of course, there are other people who are like, well, I don't care what the experiments say. I'm never going to take these, these things. There was that issue. But there were a lot of people who were convinced. And they were convinced because there was good scientific evidence to say, yes, it is safe and effective. There is no, did, nothing like that. We're going on with experiments. When people are having experiments all around the world, nobody is saying, I have questions X, Y, and Z about basic income. And, or, uh, and if, if I just find out that, it's, you know, that X, Y, and Z are true or X, Y, and Z are false, if, it's, if X, Y, and Z are answered to me affirmative, I'll be for basic income. And if X, Y, and Z are answered in the negative, I'll be against basic income. And the kind of tests you're running will actually answer questions X, Y, and Z. Nobody is saying that about basic income. So the demand for basic income experiments is totally different than the demand for experiments with COVID treatment. Now, that means that all of these basic income experiments are, in a sense, agenda-driven science. However, agenda-driven, that means we're doing them because, for, for reasons other than science, we're doing them because of political reasons. We're doing these experiments. However, just because they're agenda driven does not mean they're bad science. They very well can be bad science, but they don't have to be bad science just because they're agenda driven. So let, let me say, let me, uh, so, like, suppose, um, suppose, um, Suppose we had a, a drug that was well tested, didn't, didn't, didn't need to be tested again, um, but you were going to, uh, it was a, a drug that was going to treat, treat some disease, uh, and you have sick people. Um, you were, uh, and suppose you are a medical, you're a medical team. And you go to some remote place where they've never heard of this thing. They've never heard of this drug. They've never, and they, they, they never heard of this drug and they're very suspicious of it. And you say, okay, all of us will take this drug. All of us in the medical team sent from the others, we will take this drug and we will prove to you that it's not harmful because we're going to take it with you. Well, that's in a sense, that's your gender driven science, but it's also giving people good evidence that it's safe to take this drug. Some of these experiments can do things like that. If you if if you don't make them out to be more than they are, that they tell you more. About, the, about how basic income really works than they actually do. And you say, what they tell us is limited, but let's learn from them. You can have a good test. And that can have, that can have a beneficial effect on a debate. And when I say, but when you're a scientist, if you're a scientist, even if the person asks you to conduct the science is driven by an agenda, it is your job as a scientist to make sure that it is good science, that you're not using this experiment to lie to people. You can use an experiment to lie to people, but you have to be honest and forthright about this is what it showed, this is what it didn't show. Um, you know, you, you know, if you tell people that some experiment proves that basic income won't cause inflation, you know, you are absolutely lying. And there's a lot of other things you could be lying about if he says it does this. Um, so people, uh, you need to be a good scientist and and try to make people understand this is what it showed. This is what it doesn't show. This is what you really want to know. And this is the small, tiny implication that this test is giving you about what this shows. That's honest science, and it can have a positive effect on the debate. It can, if done well, can help opponents and supporters of this policy, even if it's not going to change their mind, it can help them conduct a debate that's better informed by facts and by understanding. So this, they might be worth doing. So the goal should be the goal of any UBI experiment should always be to enlighten the public discussion by increasing public understanding of the evidence about UBI. And 
even if even if your goal, even if you're somebody like me who's both a scientist and a strong supporter of this idea, you've got to try to put those biases you have inside aside of you. Know that you're victim of of confirmation bias. Things that you're more likely to believe things that confirm what you already believe. You've got to still try to do good science and maybe get opponents who have confirmation bias in the opposite direction to help you evaluate this policy. You can do all of that. You can try to enlighten, you've got to go, so you've got to go out and do your best effort to find good evidence. But you're still not done. Because the mere presentation of good evidence does not mean that lay people are going to understand it. You can go out and, and, and conduct the best possible, the best possible experiment and get results that are going to indicate something about that are going to get going to give some indication of the policy but if people just understand if they're just told what your findings are no matter how good your findings are if they're not made to understand what these findings do and do not imply about about it all that good evidence is going to go to waste and it's going to be spun it's going to, and it's going to be misused and it's going to be misunderstood. So the questions for this book are really two main questions, this is the book and the class. How do you do a good experiment given all the difficulties involved? That's the one question. The other question is how can citizens policymakers, researchers, journalists, and others who are interested in UBI and UBI experiments communicate in ways that lead to better public understanding of the experiment's implications for the public discussion of UBI. That's what this class is about. It's about understanding the results really than it is about the particular results of the many experiments that happened. My goal is to get you so that when you look at results of these experiments. Well, you look at somebody's plan for an experiment, somebody's conduct of an experiment, all the results being reported, that you'll be able to look at that and understand what's wrong, because I promise you it's gonna be a lot wrong. Uh, but even if it's right, you'll understand that. Um, that's my goal. More than getting you, I'm not gonna sit down and get you to memorize, okay, what do they find? What do they find in New Jersey? What do they find in Ontario? That what do they find in Finland? That's that's something you could always look up. But this critical view of how do I evaluate how this is being done? What is this likely to tell me or not? And how can I explain this to somebody who doesn't have a master's degree in economics? That's what I want you to get out of this class. Now, there is one question that when people hear what I'm saying about experiments, they want me to address this question. And I am not going to address this question. Should we have experiments at all? And I thought about that. I thought I thought about that addressing that question. Um, and that question doesn't belong in this class or in this book because because then it becomes the focus of the book. Then it becomes a book about why we should do experiments despite these difficulties, or a book about why these experiments are so are so much uh, why these difficulties of experiments are so bad that we shouldn't even be having experiments. That's what the book is about. I have to spend the entire everything in the book is relate is going to be related to that answer. I want the book everything in the book to be related to how how do we understand these experiments better. How do we help each other improve our understanding? If that's what the book about, I cannot confuse it by trying to answer this question. And besides, I think the answer has a different question on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some experiments that were probably mistakes, and there are some experiments that are called basic income experiment, and they're so far from any what, what basic income really is that they're not telling us much about real basic income at all. And then there are other experiments that have a good positive impact on the debate. I would say the Namibian experiment sparked, helped to spark this renewed interest in basic income for the right reasons, that they found good data that was promising for basic income.
Uh, so there are some experiments that have been good and whether the amount of money we're spending on experiments around the world right now, whether that is too much and we, that money would be better directed somewhere else, that I don't know. But I don't have the power to make the decision either. What I, what I know is these experiments are happening and they'll be benefit, they will, the world will benefit if this room full of 20 people all is able to help people better understand that people because most people in the world who are most people who are interested in these experiments are not understanding these gaps. A lot of the scientific researchers who are conducting these experiments are really smart, knowledge people who know these science are not paying attention to how big the gaps are between what they're really saying about how a real UBI will work and what the lay audience is understanding. And if they're not understanding it, Many of the journalists aren't understanding it, and many of the citizens and politicians aren't understanding it. They need help from people like us. Uh, so I do have recommendations, recommendations about how experiments should be conducted. If you're conducting experiments, you need to treat the experiment as a small part of the effort to answer the questions necessary to evaluate UBI. You must make absolute certain this is not a test like a spelling test. It is not even an experiment like a vaccine experiment. This is, uh, this is a small part of the evidence gathering about basic income. It can be a useful part, but it will never give you a definitive answer and has to be combined with lots of other evidence. Now, that's my general idea. That's my general recommendation. I have more specific recommendations, which we'll talk about throughout the, throughout the semester. I talk about working back and forth from the public. What does the public discussion, what do they really want to know, to what we can experiment on? And then you find your results, and then we work on what are these results that we found tell us, tell us about what the, what the public is really arguing about, and what do they not tell us? What is still lacking? I also argue on focusing on the effects rather than the side effects. I won't get into what that means right now. Um, I argue that focus on the bottom line. What people want to know is that test answer. Do it or not do it. Should we introduce UBI or should we not? And what the experiments show, will, depending on your ethical beliefs, the same finding for you might say do it, while for another person says don't do it. Pay attention to that ethical controversy and focus on people who are looking for these kinds of revolts to say, do it. Are we getting a do it indication for that group? And people who are looking for those kind of results to say, do it. Are we getting what they want? Um, address the ethical controversy without taking a side, showing that we know people have these different ethical views. How how will people differ? What meaning do these scientific results have for people who have these different ethical views? Those are my recommendations, but following these recommendations will not eliminate the vulnerability of experiments to misunderstanding, spin, misuse, sensationalism, or oversimplification. There is no solution to that. Any social science experiment like this is going to be vulnerable to misunderstanding, spin, misuse, sensationalism, or oversimplification. That is an incurable problem when you just make the decision to have an experiment like this. You have to be aware that this is a likely side effect and you have to have a plan to deal with those things rather than to try to counteract them as much as you can. But you have to understand that you cannot make these problems go away. So if you can, so you've got, it's got to be an experiment that you can also live with having. And that means, and because of that, the question remains open whether we should have them at all. And it's going to be different on a case by case basis. All right. Um, now, um, that is really the end of my lecturing on this for today. There's another chapter that I'm not lecturing on, chapter two in the book, which was in the assigned reading for today. Uh, I'm not lecturing on that chapter. I'm, I'm assuming you've all read and can understand that chapter. 
Um, but I'm, I am very happy to discuss that chapter, but also discuss the lecture that I gave here in the second half of the class was based mostly on chapter one of the book. I'm happy to discuss the lecture I just gave, and I'm happy to discuss um, uh, discuss questions about the chapter on the difference between UBI and NIT and the definitions of both. So um, what would you all like to discuss from what I brought up? Uh, um, it's uh, it starts with an E, right? What's, yeah. what's your name? Esteban. Esteban. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, um, uh, reading the syllabus on the presentation of the seminar, uh, on what we have been saying here, the discourse, regardless if it is in a matter of economics, it mm -hmm. has a stronger focus on the philosophy, mm -hmm. on the philosophical side. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was something I, I would like to address or know your opinion about. And it's this fact that if eventually carried out and implemented, uh, UBI would be a huge change, uh, whether in the history of humanity, if it would be carried out, really carried out. Mm -hmm. Basically, because, uh, well, it is what, what uh, uh, I think Gaines said once that, well, we have all these problems, but once we solve them, what we are going to do. So it's like um, human beings and society and the economy. Have always been focused on how to solve certain problems, and it seems that UBI would, like, by definition, provide, especially if it is a UBI that would provide a minimum standard of living that would be, I mean, a minimum enough to, to live well enough. Uh, that would be a huge change. Uh, what What are your thoughts about this? I mean, uh, what the political implications of that? Because uh, reading your your the text that you provided mm -hmm. for today, there is a lot of political implications on that. Um, I mean. How uh, the that idea that the absence of property in a huge uh, 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 social classes led them to be a uh, sub political subordinated mm -hmm. and this would be mean a huge change. So I mm -hmm. want to know what are your thoughts in the political aspect, of course. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's interesting thing because. Well, you started talking about the philosophy of science. I'll get back to that at the end. I'll, I'll talk about this question. That that's in, that's a right question about UBI, but in a sense, it's a wrong question about this course because it is it's it's like that inflation question. It is one of the things that we really want to know about UBI. I, I do think there's good evidence about inflation, by the way, but none of it is experimental. I, think, I don't think inflation is a big problem for UBI. Uh, there's good policies to keep inflation in check. We've been getting better and better at keeping inflation in check. Um, and I, I, I'm not really worried about basically causing inflation, but I will admit experiments cannot tell you a word, of, cannot tell you, say a thing about it because it's a national problem. Now, this one is also a national thing because to transform our lives is that basic income, when for hundreds of years, the system has been forced on us where we all have to go to somebody who owns property and work for them in order to live. Our ancestors did not have that. As a matter of fact, um, I was talking to a, 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 an Australian guy of Somali ancestry. We first found out that both of our both of our grandfather, both of us had a grandfather who was not in that position. Position. I had a grandfather who was born in eight, the 1890s. And he had a farm where he could subsist off what he made in his farm. He did not have to buy and sell. He did not have to work for the man. My friend from Somalia, well, my friend whose family's from Somalia, he's Australian. His grandfather is... Uh, a herder in Austria, in, in Somalia, and does not really take part in the cash economy. He herds his animals. But for most of us, that lifestyle has been gone. Our ancestors said goodbye to it hundreds of years ago when the enclosure movement and the, and the colonial movement took that away to us. Now, basic income doesn't restore direct access to the land. But it does restore that freedom to say, 
no, I'm not going to work for you. I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to take this basic income and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work for myself and I'm going to build some new things. And we got all kinds of people doing that. Maybe we think about somebody who's doing it as just lazing around for themselves, but actually very often they're going to be putting their basic incomes together and they're going to be doing things to help people. Uh, like the Linux operating system was, was started by a guy in Finland who didn't have a job. Who, um, who just got people together to work on, how about we create an open source operating system? Uh, and people will do things like that. And that transformation, that transformation is hard to witness an experiment. I, I, even to get an indication from an experiment, are people gonna do these kind of things? Because the ex one reason is because the experiment is temporary, is that everyone knows it's gonna come to an end, so I'm not as free to just pursue whatever I want. It might make it actually more likely for people to go and get job training. It might overestimate how much people do job training because they know when this thing is over, I've got to be ready to, to work again. Um, it, it might just simply give people an opportunity to look for a better, for a better job. But it will give you indications of how many children are, gonna, are likely to grow, are, are fewer children going to grow up in poverty. And if you know from other evidence that if fewer children are growing up in poverty, that we lose these other problems, that can give you an information, some indication if we're getting this kind of transformation. A world where no child grew up in poverty is a very different world than the one we live in, even in some of the wealthiest countries. Um, the effects of that. Those kind of big transformational things, you're going to get a tiny glimpse at those things from the experience, from these experiments. Um, a tiniest glimpse of them, and it's up to a good researcher or a good reporter, a good person who's writing about a basic income experiment, who knows statistics, knows economics, to write and say, well, it indicates this, but you need to understand it's a small indication. And there's also some things that will mean the opposite to different people on those transformational things. Let's say we have a basic income and we have a basic income experiment and a lot fewer people work. Well, for a lot of basic income opponents, that is like, aha, people are working less. I told you they're all lazy. They're all lazy bums that need the threat of homelessness to get them to take a job. Uh, that's why we have to have only conditional programs and they will react to any decline in labor effort as a reason to reject basic income. But I think that actually our lower class is working too hard and they're working too many hours for too low a pay and too poor working conditions. And people should be leaving these jobs and leaving the lowest paid jobs and, and, and commanding better wages. Will basic income cause wages to rise? Basic income experiments can't show that. The only thing they can show is the first step, because the first step in creating better wages, better working conditions, and, um, uh, and, and better respect for workers is workers leave those jobs where they have low wages, poor working conditions, and disrespect. You got to get those workers to leave those jobs. So for one guy, one guy that people leaving jobs is a bad result. That's a reason never to have basic income. For another guy, in this case, me, that is a good result because it's showing the empowerment of workers. And it's it also, uh, there's also something like, uh, there was in the 70s, there was this big thing about, um, did basic income break up families and cause divorce? Uh, and, they, and there was controversy of whether or not those experiments showed that the, the experimental group had a higher divorce rate than the control group. It's actually very, very, uh, it was very controversial whether it did or not, but both sides agreed that if the divorce rate was higher among the control, among the experimental group, that was a bad thing. That means basic income breaks up families. But actually, the old was, why would basic income break up a family? Why is it if both people in, both people in the marriage have money, they have more money than they used to, why should that cause them to get a divorce? Why would that cause a divorce if it was otherwise a good marriage? Well, and they could only think of one reason, and that was the female dependence effect, is that, is that when we, women were leaving husbands because they could. Well, there are a lot of 
divorce can be a very bad thing. But a woman who is married to a man only because she can't afford to leave him is a very bad basis for marriage. So if those did cause if those did cause divorces, I see women fleeing from possibly abusive husbands. Uh, those the kind of marriage where someone stays in financial dependence is the only because if only I had a negative income tax at 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 at, 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 at uh, about the poverty rate, then I would leave my husband. That's a bad marriage. So, is it a good result? Is it a bad result? That's the stuff we're looking at, and that ties me into what you brought up in the beginning. This is a class in philosophy of science. Okay, how many of you have ever had a class? specifically in the philosophy of science. Raise your hands if you have. Okay, I'll show the visual here. Yeah, okay, no hands up. Well, I will add my list to, I will add my name to that list. I have never had a class in the philosophy of science. And this is the first one I'm teaching. Um, it's, that's very common. I, I got a PhD in economics before I got a PhD in political theory and a job as a philosopher. And in all that time, I've never had a class in the philosophy of science. But I will tell you, you've got to be good at the philosophy of science to be a good scientist. If you don't understand the methodology, the use, the implications of science, you can't possibly be a good scientist. You can pick it up on the street, as we say. I think I've, I think I and probably all of you have learned a lot about the philosophy of science without taking a class in it. But it's good to think about these things specifically. If you don't understand the implications and how your science is going to affect the world, you're not really going to be good at doing that science. You're not going to produce valuable science. Um, okay. Um, uh, so there's a long answer to that question. Um, other, uh, other questions, discussion? Okay, that's Patrick in back. Um, you touch upon this, and sometimes I also feel like that a lot of UBI pilots or, yeah, like experiments, especially those that are financed by some fundraising mm -hmm. scheme or anything, they often just give out a UBI just, just for the sake of giving out a UBI. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, um, that there is not really much thought given to the um, to to make it an experiment in itself. Um, so I was just wondering, you were talking a lot about um, analyzing the data and communicating the results of the experiment, but is there also like should there also be more thought given to the research design of those pilots for? Um, because I think research design is a thing, is an important thing, and a good design can maybe give us like more conclusive answers, even if those answers are the tiny steps. Yeah, and very often, it's like very often um, that is. No, no, I can't step up. I, okay, um, uh, I forgot to send around the sign up sheet. So. Uh, uh, just um it's just check on april 29th check that you are here um and don't check in for a friend obviously um okay so um and there's there's that i think that is one of the difficult questions about the experiments because the responsibility for the answer, the, risk, the person who's ultimately responsible for what, the, what you're talking about, the design of the experiment, is not the economist or the sociologist that they've hired to run the experiment. It is the person commissioning the experiment, who is usually a lay person. That's very often a wealthy donor, or that is a politician or a group of politicians. So if, if you're an economist and somebody says, we're going to run a social science experiment, 
and we want you to run it, very often that's going to be no, the very, very rarely will that be no strings attached. Almost never will I say, and you just run this experiment any way you want, okay? Um, they will say, uh, we want you to do an experiment on how uh, universal basic income will affect, uh, will affect LGBTQ orphans who are just coming out of foster care and becoming adults or something like that. They'll have some idea or uh, uh, convicted felons who have just gotten, uh, uh, just gotten out of prison or, uh, or in Finland, they wanted to do it. How, how will it differently affect people who are currently on long-term benefits? So forth. They will give you these parameters. Now, so you and what the people commissioning the experiments need to do is to listen to the scientific community what's feasible before they just go out and commission something. But the scientific community then, but if you get, if somebody gives you and puts you in charge of an experiment and it has these parameters, your job then is to make your responsibility to the scientific community is to make that experiment as good as it can be under the constraints that you've been given. And there might be times you say, this, the amount of money they've given me, the, the, the design parameters they've suggested, there's no way to do this. The best thing I could do is quit. Um, but there will be other times where you can really improve that experiment. And that's, and it's, it's with that most important question. You know, how do we design this experiment is often not answered by scientists at least at the big level. Any other discussion? Um, uh, Anna. Um, I was wondering if maybe this is like something going to discuss later on, but how is the perspective of the scientific community different from the analysis? Yeah, that I think um, is, It's an important question because you're dealing with people's lives and you're treating human beings as subjects. And also the big effects of UBI are going to be, are going to be, are going to be uh, affected on one particular demographic group and that's people at the bottom. So you're going to have relatively more privileged people studying some of the least privileged people in the world. You can have anybody in a UBI experiment, but it's not going to change the behavior. Uh, you could put me in a UBI experiment like, oh, okay, no effect on Carl. Okay. Um, uh, because I've got a good salary and nothing, you know, and, 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 and I don't have any children that would be affected by it. So, um, so it's, it is, you're very often you are studying highly disadvantaged people and treating them as subjects and how do you keep their humanity one thing that people have done is try to and there's it's interesting the way you ask ask the question which is how do you take their perspective into account because that is one way to respect their humanity another is how do I protect their identity and to keep them totally anonymous so they will be treated as a subject but no one will know it was them. Those are two different strategies to keep this person's life, to keep this person's life down. Now, that is, that I think is one thing that where, where UBI experiments are actually, are, are actually easier to conduct than some other things. Because if I give you my new cancer treatment, you might die. Okay, now, um, but if I give you my new basic income, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill me. If I give you an extra 1500 euros a month, it's not going to kill you. Whereas if I give you an extra, you know, or, or if I put you in control group and you only get the extra 20 euros a month to answer to fill in the, the question form about it, that's not going to kill you either. It's not dangerous to that person. So maybe, maybe, um, maybe anonymizing them is all we do, but maybe their perspectives are important too. And it's also important to keep them on side if you're doing one. You, we need the control group and the, and the experimental group to be on the side of science, not on the side of telling you what you want to hear, 
or telling you the opposite of what you want to hear because they, they think they want to promote or sink the idea with the experiment. But to get them to be on the side of science, we just want to study this and take the perspectives into account. That is one way. The way that, the, and, and so a lot of them will have their form questions. And then they will have open-ended questions and try to get people to give their perspectives that way. The biggest way I know of so far that the perspective of the subjects has gotten into the debate was in Ontario when they canceled that. And it wasn't going to be, it was, they canceled it, I think, before they had much data to even analyze. They canceled it and the subjects took it on and said, well, this isn't about science anymore. This is about this is about activism, and this is about us telling our story and our stories being heard. Our support was supposed to be heard through this data. The data is not coming out. We got to get out there and tell our story. They saved that project, but they but it was no longer a project. The Ontario project is not about science. It is about anecdotes of people who lived through, lived through poverty and seen their lives transformed by eighteen months of UBI, and that changing them enough that they want to get out there and tell their story um that's not science but that's valuable and they and that was totally driven by them um and that is also a a, a more modern thing in science is increasingly the, the subject's perspectives are respected and considered important and it creates a whole new set of problems how do we incorporate them and i have to admit i did not mention that in the book or any of any of the writings of science Okay, anything else? Uh, uh, Maria. Yeah. Um, Maria. Yeah. Is there any way that we can bring UBI more easily testable than NIT in future or in coming years? Okay. Um, That's, that's, I, I, could, I could have an entire lecture on that question. I probably will. Okay, so if that question has not been answered by, by the next two lectures, ask that one again, because that's a really important question, uh, but it's a more technical thing than I want to get into on the first day. Um, so I, so don't, don't forget that question is really important. Why is, why is basic income less testable than negative income tax? Why is it really nearly impossible? really to test basic income. That, that I do discuss at length in the book, so it's in there. Okay, um, the person who only said their name once, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Viviana. V Viviana, oh yeah, yeah, it's two palindromes put together. Yeah, yeah. okay. So I wanna ask, uh, you just mentioned how difficult it is to measure. And mm -hmm. also during the class you mentioned all the weight and how the interest is on UBI went up, up and down. In mm -hmm. the last yeah, year. yeah. Could you could you also say that there was a, a specific uh, I don't know trend or how the research was mm -hmm. done when it comes to UBI during those years? Like what had changed from when you started your second wage till today when it comes to research? Because uh, you mentioned that now or from the 2016, the interest on this it's even bigger. Mm -hmm. Does the way we are doing, you are doing research, also make contributions on the interest of people on it? Like what? what how? Um, I, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are many things different about those five experiments during the second wave, and the. Div uh, the, the unknown number of experiments in the third one. Uh, um, the, I mean, we, we obviously have a lot better statistical techniques and better computers. That technology is improving. But the experiments st started with activists. Activists in India and activists in Namibia. And that trend has continued. The, there were no activists running experiments in the 70s. I don't know if that's because it's easier to raise money on the internet or what, but to some extent, the activists have crowded out the governments. Um, governments don't need, go, governments needed to fund those experiments in the 70s, and we got really good, big experiments. 
Now we get these activists that like, and those experiments all had, had, um, had large sample sizes, especially Sime Dime. Sime Dime was 5,000 people. That's a really big, that's a, when you consider giving a, a basic income to 5,000 people, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, the, with activists doing it, with activists doing it, very often we're getting smaller experiments because, well, we rose enough money to have this experiment where we've got uh, 200 people in the experimental group and 100 people in the control group. That's a very small experiment. And your cost of analyzing the data is going to be almost as much. Uh, and, uh, and so, we, but, but when people can do that and they are doing it, they're doing it all over the place. When governments look at that, like, well, all these activists are running experiments. We don't need to spend any money doing it. So we're getting fewer of these really big government-led experiments. That, I think, is really the biggest difference in the character of the experiments now and experiments. There are many, many little experiments. There, there were a few big experiments. There's only really been one really big experiment, well, it, which, is, which is Kenya. Was there, do you have a follow-up to Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Uh, um, Anu. So uh, I I have a question regarding the effect of UBI in underdeveloped mm -hmm. economies. Yeah. So for example, if there's a nation and the government is on the UBI side and they release a program where everyone in that nation, underdeveloped nation, mm -hmm. gets a certain UBI. Mm -hmm. So when that begins, we have uh, let's say a lot of people under the poverty line or a lot of rural population. Mm -hmm. And when this UBI comes in, maybe through campaigns or public awareness or something, the first our, the first motive of UBI activists is to make sure that they're independent of, uh, they're independent financially, that they don't have to depend upon certain services, mm -hmm. the first motive. But um, when you actually provide certain income and you tell them this is to uplift your standard of living. Mm -hmm. You spend it and you get something. Um, I'm not sure if you know we can we need to answer this question, but a lot of their motive would be to not spend it and rather save it, which actually destroys the motive of this of this income if it's in cash, because the cash is the work here. You're providing cash to fulfill certain needs, but then a person coming from a rural family might have the motive to save it. And rather, if you actually go back on feedback and say, did UBI work or not, you might see, you might realize that people are still on, on poverty. So that sort of... Well, but that's one of the things they look at. One of the things that they, 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 they look at, we, usually when they have an experiment like this, they're collecting lots and lots of data. Um, uh, home ownership, um, what big items did you buy? Like, did you buy like tools that could be used on the job or something like that? That's very important in a place like Kenya or Namibia, where there's a lot of self-employment. Um, tolls, tools, and uh, um, savings is a big thing that people look into. Savings is considered a positive result. If people save more. Uh, if people save more, that's something good. Look, basic income has increased savings. And that's something that we want low-income people to do is to create savings. Now, but, your hypo but you also have this hypothesis that the reason they're saving is because they know it's a temporary experiment mm -hmm. and they're going to be back in poverty again. And the best thing they can do right now is build up a cushion. That is one of the many, many things that might be different with a temporary UBI that you get an experiment and the permanent UBI you get in, in when you really introduce it. Um, and that's that's one of those unknowns. Is it, it, that's um, you can tell that plausible story that the reason savings was went up was because it was temporary. But you could also tell some story. Well, actually, no, that's not because it was temporary. That's just because that's one of the first things people needed. Um, and there's a lot of things like that. Um, if if uh, was was the uh, say the labor market response effect 
when as if people are, are working less when they get a basic income? Well, is that because it's temporary? And if I ever want to take time off work, this is the one time I can afford it. I'm doing it now. Or is it because, is it because, um, or am I actually less likely to take time off work um, when there's, when there's, when I'm an experiment because the culture hasn't changed. The culture says we're all supposed to go out and work. If you change UBI, you might get it. You might get it. So the, when UBI is really introduced, you might get people working. Uh, you might get people taking less time off because it's, it's not on sale any particular time. It's not like, it's not as if leisure is on sale, but you might get more people taking time off when, uh, because you've changed, the culture is gradually changing. And it's more acceptable to take time off. And these are things that the test simply can't show us. You've got, uh, you've simply got to understand what are the direction of the changes. And then you got to understand um, what are possible outcomes if changes keep going in this direction. And are there reasons why in real circumstances, are in real circumstances, are these directions, are things likely to keep going in this direction? Or is there a possible reason why they might divert, right? reverse. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a big job if you're running these experiments. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've already gone till uh to 540. Oh, okay. Boop. I just have a thought about the UBI. Yeah. I was thinking about uh, what if our experiment is to uh, just prove that the uh, UBI could just work better and uh, what if uh, at uh, what extent our UBI, uh, for example, if I conduct a UBI, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about the results that I've got, but I just want to find out or just tell people that uh, the UBI could uh, make you to reach uh, some threshold that you have no worries on the, about the jobs or that is, uh, it is not uh, necessary for you, to, uh, for you to have to take a job for surviving, but just uh, to I just want to prove that the UBI is the best thing that you can get the real freedom. I don't mm -hmm. know if this thought is right or wrong. Well, yeah, that's the kind of arguments for UBI that, that my work focuses on is that, that I think the way we've set it up where, where we think it's just right for people who don't want to work to be homeless. I think it's just the other way around. Everybody should start out with enough. And then if you want somebody to work for you, you've got to pay them enough to make them want to. Um, and, and, and an experiment, it, and those are those two different views of UBI. I really, is this, is this, are experiments aren't going to tell us which of those views is right. There's people that say everybody has to work. Or there's people like me who says everybody who wants somebody to work should pay them enough when they don't have to so that they will work when they don't have to. The experiments will give us some information about how many people work given the wages in the market and given the size of the UBI, but it's not going to tell you it's not going to tell you how basic income affects wages and working conditions, which is one of the things I really want to know. But it's also not going to tell you who's right in that ethical divide between people who think everybody has a responsibility to work or uh, no one should work unless the wages are good and the working conditions are better. Yeah. And I also have one question about mm -hmm. the, what extent of the UBI that we give to people and to cause them their, their different attitude to their works or their life. But to, uh, we get a lot of uh, we give them a lot of money, and they they would think, okay, I have a lot of money in my life uh, in, in a week, in per week or per month that I have, that I could do everything I want, or mm -hmm. we just get them uh, just uh, over a little bit the threshold that make them just uh, uh, make a living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why uh, it's one of the problems with experiments is is what level are you experimenting with. Um, and that's something we'll talk about. You can experiment with very low levels of UBI and very high levels of UBI, and that also causes other problems with what you're comparing it to. But we'll talk, we'll talk about that extensively this semester. All right. Okay. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Nihaika. Nihaika. Yeah. So in your first chapter, mm -hmm. you have four broad subtitles, mm -hmm. and you have 
And the first one talks about where it's back and forth in the public discussion with the mm -hmm. experiment. Mm -hmm. And then it states that all the growth about um, experimental findings should relate the information to the big questions that mm -hmm. are important to the local discussion. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask um, if all their thoughts were to like um, work towards what people want to hear, wouldn't that be like nudging them towards what they want to know or like? Um, if some researcher has some perspective and like making people hear what they deem to be correct, like wouldn't that be a uh, maybe I misunderstood what you wanted to write, but maybe you can correct me. But wouldn't that be a bit manipulative if everyone is kind of working towards what people want to know and like, what they want to hear and what they seem to be right? Oh no, there's a big difference between telling somebody what they want to hear mm -hmm. and telling somebody what they want to know. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, my my wife wants to know whether or not I love her. Okay. Um, uh, she wants to hear that I love her. Okay. Now, if I tell her that because it's what she wants to hear, I'm a bad husband. If I tell her that because it's the truth, it's the true answer to what, what she wants to know, I'm a good husband. So you've got to find out there, there are some things in this. I, I, I realize that that our, our our one sick participant is um, might have trouble hearing you, so I'm trying to get the mic out here. Um, that that you've got to look at the things that people are disagreeing about. Uh, people are saying basic income will do this, and other people are saying no, basic income won't do that. Can we inform that disagreement? We cannot inform the agreement. It, it is right that basic income does this. If everybody agrees, basic income does this. Um, and, and we, and, but we disagree about whether it's right or wrong, then experiment is useless. But if people are saying, I think it does this, and people are saying, no, I think it does that, then an experiment might be able to tell us something. But we had to look at these disagreements. We had to look at these disagreements and say, what are they disagreeing over? And how much is basic income really telling us about that? And how much is it not? I'm uh, sorry, how much is this experiment with basic income telling us about what a real basic income will do? So you've got to relate it. And when you relate it, you've got to stress the limits. If you're not stressing the limits of what your experiment says about the potential introduction of this policy, then you're not being honest and you're misleading people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, it is uh, it is quarter six, so uh, so yeah, it's past quarter six. So let's take off, and I will see you again. We'll start promptly at three fifteen um, next week on Friday. All right, see you all then. Bye, Andrea. Bye.